Welcome. I hope you are having a wonderful night, dear viewer. Tonight, I will be telling some terrifyingly scary stories. Make sure to leave your feedback on the comments so I can make this the best experience for you. And if you have any stories you would like me to tell, you can send them through the link in the description. Let's begin. Story one. I had just moved into my new apartment, a cozy little place on the outskirts of town. The building was old with creaky floorboards and peeling wallpaper, but it had character. I was excited to start this new chapter of my life, but little did I know that the walls of my new home would soon reveal dark secrets about my neighbors. It started on a quiet Tuesday night. I was lying in bed, trying to fall asleep when I heard it. A faint whisper, barely audible. I sat up, straining my ears to catch the words. It sounded like someone was talking, but the voice was muffled, as if coming from behind the walls. She doesn't even know, poor thing. I shook my head, dismissing it as my imagination playing tricks on me. But the whispers continued, growing louder and more insistent. I couldn't ignore them any longer. The next day, I decided to investigate. I pressed my ear against the wall, trying to pinpoint the source of the whispers. They seemed to be coming from the apartment next door. I knew I shouldn't eavesdrop, but curiosity got the better of me. He's been cheating on her for months, with her best friend. My heart raced as I realized that the whispers were revealing secrets about my neighbors. I felt guilty for listening, but I couldn't help myself. The whispers were like a drug, drawing me in with their dark allure. As the days went by, the whispers grew more sinister. They spoke of betrayals, hidden desires, and unspeakable acts. I found myself becoming obsessed, unable to focus on anything else. My once peaceful apartment had become a prison, trapping me in a web of fear and paranoia. I tried to ignore the whispers, but they were relentless. They invaded my dreams, turning them into twisted nightmares. I began to question my own sanity, wondering if I was losing my grip on reality. One night, as I lay in bed, the whispers took a chilling turn. He's planning to kill her. Tonight, I bolted upright, my heart pounding in my chest. I knew I had to do something, but what? I couldn't just barge into my neighbor's apartment and accuse them of murder, but I couldn't sit idly by either. I paced my apartment, my mind racing with possibilities. The whispers grew louder, more urgent, as if urging me to act. Finally, I made a decision. I grabbed my phone and dialed the police, my hands shaking as I explained the situation. The police arrived within minutes, their sirens cutting through the night. They questioned me, their skepticism evident, but I insisted that they check on my neighbor. As they knocked on the door, I held my breath, praying that I wasn't too late. The door opened, revealing a scene of horror. My neighbor lay on the floor, her lifeless eyes staring blankly at the ceiling. Her husband stood over her, a knife in his hand. The police tackled him to the ground, cuffing him as he screamed incoherent obscenities. As they led him away, I stood in the doorway, my body trembling with shock and relief. The whispers had been right, and I had saved a life. But at what cost? The whispers continued, their dark secrets seeping into every corner of my life. I knew I couldn't stay in that apartment any longer, but I also knew that I could never escape the whispers. They had become a part of me, a twisted reminder of the darkness that lurked within us all. And so I write this diary, a record of the horrors I have witnessed. I can only hope that by sharing my story, I can somehow find a way to silence the whispers once and for all. But deep down, I know that they will never truly leave me. They are a part of me now, a constant reminder of the darkness that hides behind the walls of our everyday lives. Story two. This story takes place a few years ago, back when I had just graduated from high school. In the summer months that separated my juvenile years from the coming dawn of semi-adulthood. I was naive then, 
still a child without a care in the world, save for my life ahead of me and spending the rest of my youthful days with my friends. So we decided to go on a trip around the world to sightsee, to be close before we were inevitably forced apart. We journeyed off into the lands of the British, to the towers of France, and even to the deep jungles of South America. It was all very fun, until we decided to head over to a little-known island by the name of Bandai Landing, somewhere in the Java Sea. If you look for the island now, it barely shows anything save for a few internet forum adventures gone bad, and Bay Namco, the entertainment company. I think our friend Canopy was the one who found out about it. He was always into the weirder side of things. The island can be considered a micronation, but the countries nearby all claim it's part of theirs. Indonesia, Malaysia, and even China have it listed as some other name. No, I'm not going to share the official name of the island. I don't want any more unfortunate wanderers. Anyway, Canopy said the island promised exquisite beaches, awesome views, an untouched air, and a sense of peace. I've never heard of this, I pointed out. Is it really a thing? He patted my shoulder. It'll be fun. My cousin's been there and she said it was awesome. So we decided to venture onto the island. We were nearby anyway. And after asking around, Canopy managed to find us a ferry that would take us there. This is where things go wrong. This is where we had to split up. I'm sorry, the old man running the boat said. The ferry's full. Canopy, Myra, and Al went on first. And the rest of us, me, Quincy, and Jan would have to stay over the next day. Now, it was only too late when we found out that there were no ferries crossing the next day. It was perfectly fine yesterday, I snapped, confused. The old man who'd ferried our friends shook his head. Today is festival, he pronounced. Water no good. There are things in the water. Evil things. What festival? Quincy demanded. But the old man had walked away, leaving us on a very empty dock. What? He sighed. It's okay, Jane assured. There's things to do here. I nodded, and we started to walk back to our hotel when a burly man appeared. He was white, not local, and had an air of gusto to him. You three really believe that crap about the festival? I looked at him, perplexed and shook my head. No. He took my hand and shook it. Name's Captain Murrow, he told, and I can take you to the island. This was great news. So I shook it and we settled on a deal. He charged double the price, being as that he was the only one willing to take us. And being naive kids, we decided it was a fair trade. We just wanted to see our friends. Besides us and the captain, there were two others on board, a rich couple that seemed to avoid us with their dog. A fancy chihuahua of some sort that barked at everything. Enjoy yourselves, Murrow suggested. It'll be an hour. An hour wasn't that bad, considering the flights we'd traveled and the hikes we'd been on. So me and my friends made small talk, and we chatted about colleges, journeys, romance, all the little things that made up life. The fog rolled in an hour later when we were supposed to have arrived. Excuse me, friends, Captain Murrow announced. We seemed to have drifted. There was a certain confusion to how he was saying his words. Of course, me and Quincy ran up on deck while Jan slept. We found the rich, pretentious-looking couple bickering with the captain. I can't wait any longer with this riff. Raff on board, she hissed, dog barking in hand. We're going to be late for the auction. Is this some sort of tourist trap? Her husband snarled. I'll pay you all you need to set us back on course. Murrow's brow furrowed. I don't know what exactly is going on, he told. This hasn't happened before. Quincy spoke up. Maybe the legends are true, and we never should have gone. I giggled at that. I giggled at that. He joked. I think Murrow found it a little funny, because he smiled. The couple most certainly did not. Kids like you will never understand what it means to be on time. The woman hissed. Always late. Her husband looked out into the mist and pointed. Look. There are... Jan came out, wondering why we hadn't arrived. 
I told her we didn't know, and the three of us, and Murrow walked over to the edge. There was nothing out there, much to the man's confusion, but the more we drifted, and the more Murrow tried to set us back on course, the more it seemed there was something out there. A sense of dread, fear, excitement. Boats, the husband shouted. Look, this was when they came into view. First, it was one or two, little wooden rafts that drifted in the distance against the ferry, despite the wind blowing the opposite direction. And then more started to come, and closer they came. That's when we saw what was on them. They were almost like dolls, burnt and faceless, strung against the boats, strapped downwards with odd multicolored ropes that stood out against the graying mist. They must be dolls, right? I asked. Quincy sniffed the air and withdrew in fear. I don't think so. I smelled it too as the wind blew, now harsh. It smelled of decay, burned flesh, and the sickly stench of burnt hair. Is this the festival? The woman pleaded, asking Murrow. She folded her arms in disbelief. Some trick. I've heard of these, Murrow murmured. Now serious. I didn't think they'd be true. Jan asked him what they were as more drifted nearer and nearer. Corpse boats, he told. It was said an unprepared traveler wandering the seas at night would find themselves met with the rafts. They would smell the decay at first and the burnt hair. Then they would see the burnt, paper-wrapped bodies strapped to the boat. It was said that once a year, a couple traveling out, those would kids would meet them and that they would vanish forever. And there was something else to them too. Staring at them for too long would, the husband gasped before Murrow could finish. Alice, look, he shouted. It's, it's Marissa. The woman looked blankly at the ocean, seeing nothing. What the hell are you talking about? She spat. Of course you're thinking about your ex at a time like this. And then she turned to the captain. Get us out of here. This trip is over. No. Look. It's... And then he stopped. And then across the boat, floating in parallel with us, was one of the corpse boats, closer than ever. The raft was different. Three sharp, pointed sticks raised upwards, and the foul-smelling doll was impaled. A stick through the top made it look upwards. She's calling my name, he stammered, walking away back. He screamed and put his hands around his ears. He screamed and screamed, backing away, terrified. We started to back away, shocked by his actions. And then he did the impossible. He ran and flung himself off the ship, whispering the name Marissa as he fell. There was no splash, just an empty nothing. What the hell, I yelled. It wasn't even a question. It was just shock. Hesitantly, the three of us looked downwards. No strung up impaled corpse was there, no husband to be seen. Just the fog, the sea, and the corpse boats in the distance passing us by. Don't look at them. Murrow snapped, finishing his story. Don't look at them or they'll take you. We instantly avoided our gaze, returning to the center of deck, staring at the ground instead. The boat suddenly hit something and it flung us to a side. I picked myself up and it was in front of me. Impossibly, an impaled, foul-smelling corpse-covered paper, arms strung almost trying to reach me. For a second, it wasn't a corpse, but the dead body of my high school sweetheart, and I almost reached to meet it, but I avoided my gaze and shut my eyes. Then my hair began to be brushed, to be braided, the same way she would do it before she'd been killed in a car accident. I heard whispers in my ear, whispers I couldn't make out that sounded all too familiar. Come with me, I heard, float away. And then I heard screaming, and the feeling of the thing near me evaporated. I opened my eyes to see the rich woman tugging at Captain Murrow. Look, she cried, pointing to the ocean. I don't. He was tugged. Want to. It's my husband, she snarled. How'd you get on one of those? She slapped Murrow across the cheek. In the sea, I saw a corpse, impaled and stretched out to reach out to her. 
The woman started back lovingly. Don't worry, I'll get you. And then she, with Merle in hand, stepped over the barrier and with her free hand, clasped the corpse's hand in hers. And then she screamed. The thing pulled her downwards with such force, her arm was destroyed. She screamed and fell over the edge, taking Murrow with her. But Quincy and Jan leapt to action, seizing him just before our captain was lost forever. Like before, there was no splash. Nothing to tell us she'd ever been there but for a confused chihuahua and blood on deck. We spent the next hour below deck, avoiding the rest of the corpse. Boats. And just as it had all begun, the boat seemed to right itself on course. The sun shone brightly, and Murrow ferried us to the docks. I texted my friends, the three who'd come before, but they didn't respond. I asked around where they'd gone. And after a while, a visitor to the island told me they jumped off after looking into the ocean for far too long. I asked further to the locals who had been on the boat the day before. So many had vanished on journey. They were only three more. I researched this phenomenon as the years passed by, wondering if they would ever be found. This event isn't local to the journey to Bande Landang, though. No, corpse boats have been sighted throughout history and in international waters. Be careful when you travel by ferry. Don't look at the corpse boats, or you'll end up like many of the missing at sea. Story 3 my wife Cheryl has been on the waiting list for a new heart for about two years. So when we got the call, we didn't hesitate to load up the car and get prepped. This was the miracle we were waiting for. The one that doctors told us not to get our hopes up for. The donor was a trucker from across state lines. Someone who was in the wrong place at the wrong time with an 18-wheeler. His family insisted that having his heart used for a life-saving surgery would be exactly what he would have wanted. Cheryl was already in her hospital gown before we even reached the surgical center. I remember squeezing her hand and we prayed together. This felt like a miracle. We didn't know it was about to become a nightmare. Her brother Max came and brought his two Nintendo Switches with an extra set of controllers to keep us occupied while in the waiting room. We played Mario Kart for about 20 minutes when the first incident happened. This hospital is pretty small, so all of the procedures happened in the same ward, including labor and delivery. We were just on the third course of the game when a strange alarm started to blare in the hallway next to us and I jumped up, wondering what was going on. I thought at first it might be that someone was trying to take a baby from the nursery, foolishly forgetting that the staff put bands on their legs. Instead, when I walked into the next set of double doors, I saw a woman frozen in place with a surgical knife in her left hand and a baby in her right. It looked like they had just come out of the procedure room and had just cut the umbilical cord. The baby was crying, bleeding a tad from their belly button. But the nurse was simply standing there as though she had just forgotten what she was doing. Miss. Miss, are you okay? I ask, trying to shake her arm. She felt ice cold. I then turned and looked toward some of the other staff members and realized they too seemed suddenly paralyzed. Phones were dangling off the hook. Orderlies had stopped pushing one woman midway down the hall. Everything was suspended for no apparent reason. I walked back out of the ward and told Max to call the police. Something's up, like everyone has had a stroke or something, I muttered to him. He nodded and moved toward the elevator trying to get it to come to our floor. Suddenly, there was a power surge. The lights flickered briefly and Max too seemed frozen. I ran to his side where he was now stuck in place, pressing the button for the elevator. I started to panic as I moved from room to room, trying to get someone's help. Why was I not being affected? I wondered as I pounded on the double doors to the surgical unit. An orderly in scrubs came to my aid. Sir, you need to wait. He said stiffly. No, you don't understand. There's something happening out here. I need to be sure my wife is okay, I said. I pushed past him before he could object and started shouting Cheryl's name. My heart was pounding as I reached the first operating room and burst in without authorization. As much as I was expecting the nightmare to get worse, it was still uncanny to see this group of surgeons, now seemingly unable to make any decision at all as their patient was bleeding out before my eyes. 
I turned back toward the orderly that was not affected and asked, Do you have any idea what this might be? I don't know. Never seen anything like it, he admitted as he ran to a red phone on the wall to try and call for help. I moved to the next room, but found it locked. On the other side, I could see my Cheryl, just being put under anesthesia. The surgeon started to gather their instruments, and I shouted to try and get their attention. Another power surge occurred, and I closed my eyes, scared I would be next. I could feel my head vibrating as I turned toward the orderly and asked if he had made contact with anyone. But he was on the floor, shaking violently. I reached for the phone and tried to dial, only to find that white noise was coming from the receiver. I stumbled back to the operation room that Cheryl was in and shouted hysterically. The surgeons had just begun to operate her chest when this strange affliction hit them. They were frozen in place with my wife's chest open, blood pouring out non-stop as I heard the machine reach a flat line. I slammed on the door in desperation, not wanting to lose her, but it was pointless. The decision had been made for me. I collapsed in a heap of tears, shaking as I tried to understand what was happening. Was this a virus? A terrorist attack? I had no clue. Then beyond the hospital walls, I heard car alarms. The sound of screeching tires. I managed to pick myself up and move toward a window to see what was happening. 18 wheelers careening out of control. I even saw a helicopter falling from the sky. It burst into flame in the hospital parking lot as I realized that whatever had happened here was now suddenly spreading. I stood there a moment longer, watching the destruction play out. Then the power went out again and I lost consciousness, my own free will taken from me. When I woke up, a day had passed. The news reported nothing about the strange event. It was as if it had never happened and the deaths and destruction were ignored. Except, I know that my wife died on the operating table. That can't be erased. I don't know what strange event happened here, but it scares me to death. It might happen again. The loss of will spreading and destroying more lives. What if soon we have no free will at all? I can't think of anything more terrifying.